Hello. Good morning, YouTube universe. We're just a few minutes away. Hang tight. The brilliant Clark Blumenstein will be joining us. Good morning, YouTube universe. We're just a few minutes away. Hang tight. The brilliant Clark Blumenstein will be joining us. Good morning, YouTube universe. We're just a few minutes away. Hang tight. The brilliant Good morning, Clark. Can you hear me? Good morning, Clark. Can you hear me? We we can't have any copyrighted music playing because it'll take down our video. Good morning, Clark. Can you hear me? We we can't have any copyrighted music playing because it'll take down our video. Good morning, Clark. Can you hear me? We, we can't have any copyrighted music playing because it'll take down our video. I think we can have the exception for uh, academic we, use. We can't have any copyrighted music. Can you okay, hear me? I think we're live. Can you hear me, Clark? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Okay. Good morning. We already have people watching us, believe it or not. Wow. And I can take the uh, I can take the about to go live sticker off. <laughs> Because we're already live. We're a couple minutes late, but that's okay. I entertain the crowd with uh, your website, so I can do fancy yeah. stuff like that. And I can do this. So good morning, everybody. Thanks for hanging on. We are live on the complete worldwide internet with the amazing speaker builder, designer, innovator, engineer. I'm sure you have other accolades. Clark <laughs> Blumenstein, coming from the East Coast. Where are you again? I'm in Eastern Tennessee. Eastern Tennessee. So right the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. I've been to the Smoky Mountains, but maybe not the Appalachian Mountains. I've been to Tennessee, but let's not go into all that. So, Probably. are you? How are you doing, Clark? Are you ready? And oh yeah, feeling good. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I can play a few seconds of music as long as it's from an academic uh, exception. Um, you know, I could introduce it and... and uh, well, well, stuff that um, YouTube has sound scan automatically scanning stuff. So oh, yeah. after the video is done, they, they will process it. They will process our language to see what words came out of our mouth. They don't like bad words. Right. And... and and depending on what each individual record company says, some record companies say, we're going to monetize that video. We'll let it go, even if it's two seconds. But now the mon but now the ad revenue goes to them, not Greg. 
And that's all I'm getting out of this video is a few seconds. So if you have something that's I need to go to you, sir. So. Not not a major. If you have something that's like not a major release, like an independent release. Yeah. Um, yeah. But some video, some record companies say we're just going to block the video and take it down, and he can't show it at all. So that would be a problem. So I'd be careful showing anything. If you had a live recording that you made in studio and nobody has ever heard it but you and your friends, that's okay. But let's talk because we're here to talk. Sure. And we can't really hear the beauty of your your system on uh, on these little tiny, you know, laptop speakers. So, folks, we're with Clark Blumenstein from Tennessee, who is a very interesting uh, speaker builder, designer, innovator. And I asked him to come on the channel when I uh, found out that he was creating his own line of speakers at Blumenstein Audio. And a couple of things I want to get to today is the difference in what he's doing versus what 98% of the mass market is doing. The speakers that he's designing are nothing like you're going to find at Best Buy. Uh, they're high efficiency, they're concentric driver, they're handmade wooden boxes. And it's 8 a.m. here in Los Angeles where I'm still asleep. So I'm still drowning my neurotransmitters and caffeine. So where do you want to begin, Clark? You're you're more wide awake than me. Where should we begin this story? Sure. Well, you brought up uh, single drivers, and that's definitely the road less traveled. It has been a, uh, a more rare type of speaker since I began uh, building speakers and apprenticing to do so. Um, originally, I was trying to get to the same experience I was having with the Sennheiser HD 600 headphone, which I was introduced to back in 2002. And that was a real mind blower, uh, just out of a portable CD player at the time. But <clears throat> are, are those planner or any fancy design like that? Huh? Are those some sort of planner weird design or are they just regular dynamic well, headphones? Yeah. Yeah. They're, uh, they're just single driver headphones, uh, open back headphones, um, kind of a studio standard amongst the recording industry. And then still with the headphone audiophile community, which I've been a member of since about the same time. And um, I started going to head meets and meeting people that made exotic tube amps and were getting really good sound out of the Grado RS1 and, uh, you know, those kinds of classic headphones. I, I think I have, I have a Grado something laying around here. That's what I use. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Old Grados, not the super fancy ones. But, but saw, headphones have always been single speaker, right? Single concentric. Well, now, I mean, there, there were good multi-driver headphones back in the 70s. Uh, I want to say there's an electro planer. Uh, I'm totally mm -hmm. misquoting it. There's a classic headphone that kind of has an electrostat and a dynamic element in it. But but that my point basically. my point is most headphones are single driver and most loudspeakers yes, not single driver. So what brought you into single driver for big they, speakers? It used to be that way. So <laughs> it used to be that most speakers were wideband drivers. And that was more than adequate to cover the AM radio band, which is about 10,000 hertz to 150 hertz, 200 hertz, give or take. And um, so you didn't need the additional helper woofer and tweeter above, above and below that. And so then as soon as woofers and tweeters came along, people said, well, let's give the lion's share of the work to the tweeter and then the lion's share of the work to the woofer. And the crossover point changed and it, eventually got into the vocal range, uh, which I think is a, a no-no as an engineer. Uh, if you're interrupting the human voice right in the middle of the consonants, uh, it gives a dull sound. It's, it loses its punch and life and intelligibility to us as human listeners. You know, so it's less about producing a perfect result to a measurement microphone and much more about producing a uh, a beautiful yet slightly imperfect result for the human ear. And your speakers are primarily designed for humans, I understand, which is good. Uh, 
yeah, sometimes the dog listens up, but <laughs> yeah. But where we've gone with speakers in the last, I don't know how many decades, two drivers, three drivers, four drivers, and now a middle of the word could be partly this thing. And, you know, you know we're breaking right. up speakers. We're breaking up a word or a phrase into multi speakers that don't always work together. Right. Um, and you're kind of talking about the crossover and with how the work is shared. But another issue is the, 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 the point in space that it's emanating from. Yes. Yes. So that's also an important consideration. You'll probably get there eventually. I didn't want to interrupt. So. Yeah. Well, really though, I, you know, I look at it as it's a multifaceted reason to use single drivers, but the lossiness of a crossover, it's a power hungry component. You know, the amplifier is producing uh, vibrations and it, and they are getting damped down in the crossover. And then you're trying to bring that back to life after that point, which just to me as an engineer uh, doesn't make sense. So, um, so yeah, my speakers are, are like a really good uh, fixed gear bicycle. You know, I don't personally ride fixed gear bicycles, but it's a good engineering analogy. Right. It's when you have just a single sprocket and pinion, uh, there is greater mechanical efficiency there. And that is the truth with single drivers is that you have one wire going all the way, you know, through the output transformer of the amplifier and through the speaker wire, through the single voice coil and back. And there's no uh, filter components in there that are kind of, you know, hogging a lot of the power that should be getting to the speaker driver. So that means your speakers don't have any kind of crossover because they don't need one because there's nothing to cross over. Correct. Yes. And so more of the money can be spent on the nice box and the nice driver and more of the power money yes. resources yes. goes where you want it to go, which is from speaker to ear mm -hmm. and more, um, and there's less compromises because you're not throwing 16 not different throwing power away. Yeah. And, you know, if you're, for instance, a great analogy is top fuel drag racers. They have one gear and a clutch that is very complex. And so they're basically pulling out the clutch the whole run uh, or about two thirds of the run. And then it finally locks in and, and gets the motor engaged and the motor revs it up. But the point is, is that you, if you're trying to go a quarter mile in three and a half seconds, uh, you don't have time to switch gears. And music is very fast. It's not slow. And the human voice is very fast. And all this information is very fast. So how do we communicate the artist's intention more closely to the listener? Is just pull out all the filters, pull out all the stops and let it all go. And that, yeah, one driver isn't going to be perfectly even top to bottom. You won't get perfectly flat frequency response, but by virtue of the fact that the life is there and the brightness and the energy and the punch, uh, you know, that was there in the, in the lyrics and in the bass and in the treble, um, that that coming through, uh, with more of the original recorded energy, you know, cause the, cause a microphone is not a multi-element unit. You don't have a multi-driver microphone is a great analogy. So you have a single diaphragm as a microphone and then a single transducer on the other end. Now, of course, I, 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 have, I have one ear tympanic membrane. I should get three. I should get a, a tweeter, a woofer, and a mid-range tympanic membrane. That would probably be much better. Well, yeah, and, and you can see uh, back that way. Sorry, I'm not used to being on a camera. Um, there, brr, there's a subwoofer. And I'm gonna zoom in up, can't zoom in. Yeah. So I, the, I'm uh, still using that big box behind you is the subwoofer, also. Okay. Right. So even though it's a single driver loudspeaker, let's see what the zoom looks like. Yeah. So that yeah. big box is a subwoofer, which is also your design and your uh, from your company. Uh, actually, it's just a prototype. I took a subwoofer, right. it's a Miller and Kreisel cabinet sealed, mm -hmm. and then I stuck a Eminence Lab 12 woofer into that, which is a very good woofer. And the uh, frequency response is around 
23, 24 Hertz or so in that cabinet. It's like a 1.1 cubic foot sealed box. And that'll be about what the final product is. When I build this as a subwoofer commercially, it will be a passive unit. And that's all the, that's the only kind of subwoofer that I make is a passive subwoofer. And then I give you the subwoofer amp and a box that goes closer to your equipment and um, having mechanical separation between the, the vibrating subwoofer and the sensitive electronic components in the amp, it ups reliability. And it's also better for sound quality because you have just an acoustic box with, of just wood and wood is very fast. And as soon as you attach a weight and amplifier to that box, like a normal active subwoofer has the amp right on the box, uh, that slows the bass down. Um, in my and are you talking um, uh, tube amplification even for the subwoofer? That's That becomes an option because I build a passive sub. So I have a lot of clients that, well, not a lot, but you know, maybe 4% or 5% or so um, go with an aftermarket subwoofer crossover and then an aftermarket tube amp just for the sub. And my subs are not especially power hungry. You don't need to throw you know, a thousand watts at them or anything, you know, a, a, a good 25 watt tube amp or a 15 watt tube amp is all that a sub really needs. Well, let's, let's go back to the, um, the speaker design. Yeah. So we talked about, um, the, the, the purity of one driver and, uh, it's always in phase with itself. That's a big problem with, um, multi multi-driver speakers is you can never really be sure if they're both in phase with each other there's nothing to be out of phase with which which in theory sounds like a great idea um so do you uh do you experience a good or a great or a di different kind of sound stage with your design because that's a big deal for yes. me is to hear the 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 sound not come from a speaker, but be, come from the room, come from the environment, come from the middle of the speakers. Can you address that concept a little bit? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's a paradox because once you shrink the sound down to a point source and like, here's my smaller speaker, um, you know, once you have a, a little point source, paradoxically, the sound source to your brain in terms of localization, they, the speakers themselves disappear and then you get a little bit more perfect panorama. So like a good example is in a symphony, you have a greater likelihood of being able to single out individual violinists in their row in the way that the symphony is laid out. You'll hear that the layout more clearly on a single driver speaker. And just to address phase, it's actually that's actually a really complex topic because uh -oh. our audience doesn't want PhD level. Let's keep it. Oh, <laughs> well, I don't have a PhD. I mean, let's I'm, keep it. I'm well, let's keep our listeners. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? But I understand. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it, I don't. A lot of people don't even know what phase means. But phase. I'll I'll say, if you have two speakers, this is a side view. Are they vibrating at the same time when they're playing the same note? Are they? working right. against one another. That's, that's a third grade version of what phase means. In phase, yeah. out of phase. That's, yeah. so that's a great phase. explanation. Yeah, is um, sine versus a cosine wave. Sorry for the trigonometry. I was going uh, with trigonometry. trigonometry, 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 trigonometry. Yeah. <laughs> hmm? I said, now he's going to trigonometry, which I haven't seen. <laughs> well, I mean, you should pay attention to trigonometry. It's important stuff. I mean, Matt I learned it. I learned it finally when I had to teach it to my son. But <laughs> when I was in high school, I didn't know it, and I did pass calculus without trigonometry. Yeah, but let's yeah. not freak out the people with <laughs> nerd talk. I have to keep the nerds in line, people, so they can buy hi-fi and enjoy the music. That's my yes, goal. Yes, absolutely. And um, but yes, but of is and, it's a big problem with most speaker designs. And the single driver fixes that. I would guess it's pretty simple. Well, it doesn't fix it. It just is it. And that's, yeah. that's the point of the single driver approach is it's just like your, your microphone is not a multi-element 
uh, transducer. And so you're trying to more closely match just the physics happening inside of a microphone. Um, so a multi-driver speaker, like let's say that, that this is a base cabinet here, and then we have the uh, treble cabinet here. Let's just imagine that this is a woofer and this is a tweeter. So the sound source from this is coming, you know, off, it's vibrating, propagating that way. And the sound source here is propagating, you know, much more loose ways, grabbing more space more immediately. And then the, the. We're losing your signal, Clark. Can, did you get me back? Hi. Okay. I think it cut out for just a second. Cut out. Is someone in your so, yeah, uh, house is loading, downloading like 20 tight waves, videos? And then the woofer is coming out very loose. So where these waves interact, you know, where you have the treble expanding and then the, the bass expanding, there's something called a, you know, inter intermodulation. So the waves interact and they become one again. So this happens in multi-driver speakers at the gap between the drivers. So the problem with multi-driver speakers is this distance from here to here is that you, you can never recombine this with this. It will always be separate. They'll expand and then combine right in the middle and it gets very messy and you hear a lot of that. Now, granted, you also hear some great extension from the tweeter, you hear some great extension from the woofer. And as I mentioned, I technically make multi-driver speakers because I'm still using a subwoofer. And in some of my designs, I still use what's called a super tweeter, which is just a tweeter that's acting very high frequencies only and up. So it's not addressing the mid range. All the mid range is coming from the paper cone as much as possible. And all the bass is coming as much as possible. So I try to stretch my crossover points as far out as possible to just hear mostly one driver and then a little sprinkle of salt on top. You know, I, I think of a tweeter as a flavor enhancer in my line of work. You know, so it's, it's just bringing MSP, out me, I would say of the of the main driver now like these drivers are three inches di diameter so they really don't need a tweeter the response of this cone is 35 kilohertz really down to uh 90 hertz so it's a you know kind of a high subwoofer crossover point most subwoofer cro crossover points are around 40 50 hertz or 30 hertz um whereas these do need a little more help of a subwoofer and it's a good idea to have the subwoofer right next to the main speaker or below uh, in order to keep the phase at 90 hertz intact um, because those waves, if you spread them apart, you'll get phase distortions and stuff in the bass, which is a bad thing. So there are, there are compromises to my approach. There are compromises to multi-drivers. And really what good audio is about is sort of choosing the best compromises that appeal to your musical taste and your intentions and in, in listening. You know, if you're trying to listen for distinct detail, uh, it's a good idea to get a single driver. What were you going to say, Greg? Um, well, I wanted to move the conversation to another aspect of your, of your speakers, which is the woodworking. Um, because you do, in addition, you do woodworking very different than most commercial speakers out there. Um, and maybe I'll let you explain it. For, but from my point of view, um, your speaker boxes are probably more resonant than some of these boxes that we get that are made out of MDF with a lot of padding. And uh, why is your speaker design, your box different? And you also have a history in woodworking. Maybe you want to touch on that too, how you got to be. Because you know woodworking, you know speaker design, you know electronics. You have the whole package one guy <laughs> doing everything. Well, my degree was actually in music history. And then uh, while I was pursuing that degree, I got met up with, on a school field trip actually, with a local uh, high-end audio company by the name of Kane and Kane Audio. And Terry Kane and I became fast friends and his wife, Leslie, and, um, and I became their apprentice. Uh, that was right here on the West Coast, right? That's right. That was in Walla Walla, Washington. Walla Walla. 
say that five times fast. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, so I started learning uh, single driver speaker design from Terry. That was the kind of speakers that he made. And I actually own that product line since he passed away and then his uh, widow passed away too. And I was very sad. We were, we were in close touch. Um, and, uh, but really extraordinary people um, and artists, lifetime artists. So their approach to woodwork was more along the lines of like George Nakashima and, and natural uh, as much as possible. But Terry also had a background in building kitchen cabinets and stuff. So he did use spray finishes and did use stain and, and tried to match home decor. And I'm a little bit more of a purist with woodwork back to the roots that they taught me of the George Nakashima approaches to as much as possible to kind of let the wood speak. Yeah. So if we the, have no idea who George Nakashima is, because. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great, great history lesson is all of the live edge um, coffee tables and, and that whole design paradigm that's very popular in home woodwork now. Uh, that's really from him. He was a, a Japanese American and settled in uh, Pennsylvania, I hope. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting this at the moment. I've seen one of his museum exhibits and it uh, later on, it was maybe about four or five years ago. And that really blew me away because I'd only seen his work and, and pictures and his daughter has since carried on the shop. And um, he was, he was a world citizen. And that was something that was very important to him as a woodworker is that he was not making woodwork for any one place or person, um, but really trying to let the wood itself stay as natural as possible. So the live edge approach and, oh yeah, there you go, yeah. So, so, so live edge means he didn't cut the edge, it's sort of just the natural, the wood's natural. Correct, yeah. Naturalness. Mm -hmm. Got it. And the butterfly Those joints, he helped popularize that. But really the, the minimalist and mid-century modern wood table aesthetic, I mean, you Googled it, pulled that up, that looks like a lot of fine tables that you might see on Etsy or, mm -hmm. you know, that you might order from a, a pro cabinet builder and you see those in people's homes. Um, yeah, but a, what, what we might call a primitive approach, which with not a lot of um, decoration and, and, and just, this is what yeah. the wood is. We didn't cover it. We didn't carve it. Yes. This is the beauty of the wood. Yeah. So um, I know. Nakashima, by the way, he made, seven uh, tables, one for each continent <laughs> as a uh, dedication for world peace. And I have sent speakers to seven continents. I donated a pair to the South Pole Observatory, which is a very interesting telescope project, by the way. Wow. Um, do so they use them? Do they ever, do they yeah. acknowledge them and use them and listen to them in the... Yeah, yeah, totally. And they're there as well on like, long-term durability testing. So uh, it's the highest, driest place in the world, roughly, you know, one of the highest and driest. Well, you so really have these three speakers that have been tested in that environment. Correct, correct. So it's- and Actually, it makes sense gone. because uh, they probably don't have a lot of resources to be wasting on giant speakers and, and stuff. So it sort of fits with their lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, it's it's worth taking a tour of the interior of that space because they have like a movie room and book room and um, I mean it, it's kind of sparse, you know. It doesn't look too fun, so I hope I I hope I jazzed it up a little bit for them because I mean you, we can all use more music in our lives, uh, even me. You know, I don't get as much music listening as I wish I could have. I agree. I spend yeah. more time buying records, cleaning records, <laughs> watching YouTube videos about records than listening to records, which is a bad a bad thing. But once you get that sound system that is engaging, it's like I got I, it's addictive, and then you want to listen to the music. Yeah. So, so we didn't get to the topic of the woodworking that you do, sure. Which, which is, I don't think you use any kind of particulate 
engineered wood. You use actual wood. Yeah, and, yeah. So I and you use a wood that's thin enough to vibrate, and you do a lot of cross bracing inside. I right. think. Yeah, yeah. So it's Which is more like a guitar or a violin than a big heavy speaker. Is that well, fair that's, to say? That's a little bit of a misconception because the reason I use Baltic birch is that it's actually much stronger than MDF, mm -hmm. and you can use a thinner. Uh, piece of it to achieve the same strength. Okay. And so what I'm really trying to get, uh, what's very, very important for single driver speakers is to have the sharpest impulse response possible. So impulse response is that when the driver moves, of course, Newtonian physics is for every action, there's an equal and opposite mm -hmm. reactions to the driver. Again. The cabinet moves. Oh, oh, physics are fun. <laughs> they, they really shouldn't be uh, I mean, it's 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 all fun. But I I, I took AP physics. Great. But yes. no, Newtonian. What about quantum astrophysics? I'm just kidding. Um, no. That impulse re response thing I hadn't really thought of. Yes. You want fast fast response time when the driver moves, the cabinet moves. But a lot of designs today, they don't want the cabinet to move at all, and they make it thick and they deaden it with polymers and deadening material and, yeah. and you don't do but, that i think see, I, I, you know the, the thing is about that is that those cabinets are not as dead as you think like sorry wilson but you go up to a wilson banesh cabinet go wrap the side of it and it's gonna sound off it's it's a residue it. box you know let's do it on my krk studio yeah. monitors these are vintage monitors they're very thick they're very heavy yeah Let's let's do this. Give it a wrap test. These are not like the new KRKs that are made today. Okay. Yeah. Pretty, a, pretty loud, right? As so, opposed to as opposed to a wooden cabinet. So listen to that. You guys see how that's very dead. Yes. Right. But it's a different tonal it's quality. Even, it might be a different tonal quality, though. Is that possible? It might be a what? A richer tonal quality. It might have more harmonics in it. Now we're getting really far yeah. afield here. Okay, yeah. So that that's the part where to model those harmonic stacking stuff. That that is very complex uh, math, and it's it's hard for my brain to go there on a layperson scale, which let alone I barely understand. Even though I studied the stuff. Um, in in college uh but yeah it's so harmonics let's just forget harmonics for a second and look at just impulse response so that's when the driver moves what else in the cabinet moves are we rattling the box so one of the most important things that i do in my enclosures is uh i isolate the driver very carefully from the box it's a it's a lossy contact. So I'm using uh, damping material between the driver and the cabinet. Now this is an older design. This is actually uh, pair number 15. <laughs> a little embarrassing, but um, I've, I've shipped out my other stuff. So I did used to build them a little bit more resonant. This, is, this had no bracing inside. And my newer designs are heavily braced and thicker wood. Um, and one of the things that I do is uh, each panel on my newer stuff is a different thickness. So I'm trying to, you know, because the side panel is bigger, it needs to be thicker in order to not resonate for the share of what the top should be doing and what the front should be doing. So because the front and the that top- is thicker, did you say? Yeah, so the top gets thinner and then the side gets thicker. And, and that's just, if you think about like the way that a balloon would expand towards its thinnest spot, what we're trying to do with a speaker enclosure is to not have priority given to any one facet of the box. So like your KRKs back there, those are squares. So using the same thickness uh, material, or sorry, cuboid or, or something like that. Cuboid. Yeah roughly the same <laughs> thickness of wood on each facet is quite appropriate.
um, because the walls are about the same shape, uh, sorry, about the same size. But if you go to most uh, commercially available speakers, um, they're just using three quarter inch MDF. And I used to use mostly three quarter inch birch or three quarter inch bamboo. And the top would be less resonant than the side. And I started to analyze this and, and make them differently. Um, and that's, you know, if you order them new from me, that's what shows up at your doorstep is the tuned thickness uh, model. Um, but, you know, anyway, so the, the point with birch is strength to weight ratio. And that's also the point with the single driver itself. So uh, paper cones at this scale need to be very light and thin, yet strong. And that's why paper is a great option. Um, carbon fiber has been tried. It's, it's extremely robust at high power levels, but I'm not doing high power levels. I'm doing, you know, one, two, three to maybe 10 watt uh, tube amplifiers uh, for most of my own home use. Though I do have powerful solid state amps that sound great. And I, and I tune them to work with kind of either amplification or not. I'm sorry, what, what type of, um, what type of power of amp are you typically running back there? So I these are that. SETs, which are single ended triodes. And specifically my favorite tube is the 2A3 tube. It's a classic. Uh, it still holds up really well. I don't want to get off. I didn't want to get off the uh, the build. I just wanted to remind yeah. us what what wattage you you you're able to push those with. Yeah. So it's like a six watts behind you. So yeah, let, let's. Uh, no, these are one watt per channel. One watts. Let's re yeah. let's rewind really quick. We'll, to we'll go back to the woods. Yeah. yeah. So the problem with MDF is that it's hamburger wood. It is wood particles that are then suspended in glue and dried. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can smell this when you cut it. It smells <laughs> gluey. Um, whereas Baltic birch has a much higher just straight grain wood content. Uh, one of the cool things about wood in its solid form is that straight grain wood is, is, is extremely stiff uh, axially. So it has very good resonant properties and that's why it's used in instrument building for resonant wood boxes. But in a speaker, you know, I'm trying to get a balance between uh, a little bit of life and resonance from the wood enclosure, and then really mostly a dead sound, you know? So I, I am trying to end at the same goal, same-ish goal as an MDF uh, enclosure, um, but I'm actually trying to do better than that. And if you look at like really high-end PA systems, for instance, those are not MDF because they wouldn't hold up under the moisture or the high power levels. If you look at really extreme car audio, you're looking at a birch enclosure. You're looking at fiberglass. You're not looking at MDF because the driver will rattle the box apart. So MDF is, is a good way to see it is that it is consumer grade audio. And I don't care how much they gussy it up. I don't care what veneer is on it. It still <laughs> sounds the same. And it sounds like boom, 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 boom. It actually has a very low tone to the resonance, which is a high energy domain because we're talking about a low frequency. And that energy does propagate harmonically up in the higher frequencies. So MDF has a signature sound to it. Everything has a signature sound. Drywall has a signature sound. Brick has a signature sound. The it human skull. What the material, yeah, my own head is very thick. Uh, no, so, <laughs> so, you know, it, the, the best you, you some of the really expensive stuff. speakers out there, $50,000 speakers, you're saying are just MDF with a nice veneer. Yeah, yeah. And, and they don't, fashion. they don't have a skill to do woodworking at it's most of these skill. places. No, no, it's, <laughs> It's not they have a computer that's cutting MDF and glue and bolting it together. Sure. And really what MDF is about is it's about the race to the bottom. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's all that there is to it. That summarizes so, American culture perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> sure. And, but, no, and I, I don't mean to knock all MDF speaker enclosures. Some of them sound fantastic. You're not going uh, to 
You're not going to knock them? <laughs> well, go and knock them all. And that, that is one thing, is that they will you will hear them sound very similarly in that, in that resonance character. And so the, the really important thing about resonance is that you can't stop it. You cannot kill it inside the box. You can kill most of it. But the remnants, the stuff that still comes through, is so heavily filtered and out of phase. And, and it's, it's like uh, that it doesn't sound dead anymore. You know, it's, it's one of the most interesting parts about speaker design is that you can make your cabinet walls three inches thick and you can knock them. They will still resonate when the driver is moving and you put a stethoscope, you know, put just go try a stethoscope right in your ears and go listen to the side of that box that's marketed as dead as doornails. And it is not. It just isn't. And the only Nothing way to deaden hard. is to make a concrete speaker that's you know, five inches thick. Sure. It's not very practical because of the shipping costs yes. for one thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and when it breaks, when UPS drops it and it, cr and it shatters into a thousand pieces. So that's really not a viable. So let's not even go there, but I'm just saying people come up with extreme ideas. Yes. Yes. And, and really balance about all these different things, you know, totally, totally. Weight, size, frequency response, resonance, cost, shipping, how easy is it to manufacture? Yeah. All that all those compromises have to come into play. Otherwise your speakers would cost, you know, zillions of dollars and you'd only be able to make one a year. Yeah. So so uh, the other thing about your your wood design is you you put them together differently. You don't have any screws or bolts and you probably have a good reason for not wanting a metal screw inside the wood. Uh, well, this, this model actually has screws in it. Oh, no, it has screws in but it. These were my 15th pair. I'm now on a couple thousand pairs. I've been doing this for 17 years now. So but these are older. But your um, new speakers are, are screwless, as they say? Or well, actually, not? I still have. I, I ended up discontinuing this model, mm -hmm. uh, and then I... It, it came back by popular demand. This visual design element, the concentric rings, was very appealing to people, and it it always had just like a little a little bit of this kind of sound to it. And to mm -hmm. my ear, and I wanted to overcome that and make the the next best and all of that. So that's why I discontinued it. But I re-released it because I later found out that I can make the seal on the back uh, more perfect. And, and the juncture and uh, screws are in a different place and I have breaks for the screws. And and um, so you're not really hearing the screws anymore. But these old models, uh, sometimes they would sound really well when you would torque the screw just so. And, uh, and that was kind of, you know, a funny aspect of them. I mean, I, I built these in a, uh, out of a metal shed in my backyard right after graduating college. Um, so they're, they're pretty funny. I mean, when I think about the conditions that they were built under and that they still held up pretty well and look pretty good. Um, but I've never changed the, you know, the fundamentals of them. I use a little bit better glue now. Um, I use a little bit better oil, um, better sanding, but most of it has remained the same. The internals have changed quite a bit, as I mentioned. You know, I'm now using like a very, very stiff internal bracing out of solid wood. So I'm mating solid wood to plywood. And that's yet another way to, to strengthen the crap out of them. Because um, a, a lot of people. The plywood, the plywood is a specific species. It's not just Home Depot plywood when you say plywood. Oh, it's just Baltic birch, it's Russian birch. Um, mm -hmm. and I've used some American production birch as well, and it's fine. Um, so I, where I'm trying to get where the, the idea of using plywood or plus solid wood bracing is that you wouldn't build a bridge out of MDF. <laughs> okay. You would want some granular strength to the material that you are using, or you would want an extrusion of the steel 
that is laid out for proper engineering strength in, et cetera. Because if you make it out of hamburger, uh, it is not <laughs> going to, yeah. <laughs> it's it's just uh, not going to hold up. So um, and NDF is, is very porous. Yes. And subject yeah. to water can make it uh, yes. expand and contract. Correct. And, and get moldy. And I've seen some MDF things that I left a pair of speakers outside and yeah. <laughs> what they looked like after a year was was a good lesson in why MDF, it's almost like sand after a year. Anyway. Oh, yeah. It it fully disintegrates. And we have a generation of audio engineers that have been brought up thinking that it is the pinnacle of speaker building material when it is simply not, you know, you can, you can build a, a speaker out of, you know, drywall that will sound pretty good. I mean, it, you can build one out of a cardboard box, just, just layer cardboard box with flex seal, you know, <laughs> flex seal, right? <laughs> And, yeah. and you can actually get a pretty deadened enclosure. It's all about how you mix materials with each other and how you harness certain materials qualities and deaden them and then put other ones there and deaden that. So, you know, for instance, like the glue that I use is, uh, is just tight bond three. It's the waterproof stuff, but that glue has a resonant quality to it and it's pretty dead. If you use tight bond one, it's actually a little bit brighter and more lively sound, which I don't want. Um, you know, I'm trying to trying to get that balance. So a lot of the way that I arrived at my speaker designs was starting with the cane and canes and the way that they were doing things. And then they sent me home with design homework with little models to to try to release. And then I just started changing the glue or changing the finish or um, the driver and and trying to get my own engineering paradigm going and my well, own sort of sound. So let me, let me ask you something else about the overall design, which is high efficiency. Yes. Um, the, the cabinet that's the, the, the lightweight stiff cabinet probably has better efficiency than a, than a big fat dead stuffed MDF box. The drivers are efficient the uh, fact that you don't have crossover sucking up electricity, all three of those things add to efficiency or sensitivity maybe is a better word. The two words are related. Yeah. But this is important when we talk about what amps you want to put it to. So yeah. that's something I kind of want to discuss here is that uh, now people are, are rediscovering low wattage tube amps and, um, there's lots of people selling low wattage tube amps. There aren't very many people selling high quality, highly efficient speakers. So I think you're in a really a great position to marry those two things together. Can you discuss sensitivity, oh, yeah. sensitivity, efficiency, mm -hmm. tubes, and the Blumenstein results? So uh, sensitivity is a measurement. That's the 2.83 volts. Oh my God, here he goes again. Uh, <laughs> Whereas efficiency is, is more of a quality, it's like a characteristic um, that might encompass, you know, more aspects. Well, the sound of a speaker might be, you know, perceptibly high efficiency just because of the tonal character. Whereas the sensitivity is like the average of all frequencies and, and it's the graph and all of that that you um, put in there. Hey, David. You know David? Yeah, he's one of my clients. Yeah. Okay. David, I don't know when he left that message because I wasn't paying attention. Oh, I just saw a few, up. a few minutes ago, five minutes later. I forgot to ch I forgot to click that box. So I'm sorry, you're talking about efficiency and sensitivity, which right. are related but are not the same thing. Correct, correct. Yeah, and so uh, high efficiency speakers, that is a business with an inherently high overhead. You're using expensive drivers, expensive wood, uh, manual production techniques, hopefully. Um, and uh, the tube amps, you can have a pretty good tube amp business. And this isn't to knock any, any of the new tube amp businesses, but you can really run that on your kitchen ta table. Whereas I have two outbuildings, uh, plus the single car garage is a wood shop. And, and then this is a dedicated listening room. 
Uh, I have stereos downstairs. The dining room is where I solder up and finish. You know, so really more than half my house is a speaker company. Um, and that's just, you know, that's how you do it. Um, and it, it requires a lot of, uh, physical work. You're, you're lifting heavy objects all day. Um, and it's, it's well, hard. Those, those muscles look pretty intimidating. So. <laughs> no. Uh, only to the wood. Uh, you know, I, I definitely am, am strong enough to do what I do. And, um, and that's hard to maintain, by the way. And he's referring to the efficiency of the stereo, not so much your your plant, as they say. Yeah. But, yeah. Th but this, is a, this is the opposite of how most stuff is sold today. And um, a little anecdote, I met one of the most famous designers. Um, what's his name? Andrew Jones at one of these hi-fi events. Yeah. And I commented that his little box speakers... Um, he was coming out with a new line and I said something about, you know, are these kind of low efficiency also? And his, his, his standard comment is, um, Watts are cheap. Oh, and very much the opposite of your philosophy because, you know, you can buy a hundred watt amp or a D class amp. That's a hundred or 150 Watts. And, the concept is as long as you throw enough watts at this little tiny thing, he'll make them for very cheap out of thick MDF and, you know, et cetera. Tiny and magnets, a, yeah. And that's the complete opposite of your of your design philosophy and, yes. and sort of the tube philosophy. So if you can comment on that. Well, the thing about design paradigms is that they can be done competently uh, with all sorts of handicaps. So... I think Andrew Jones' speakers sound pretty good. I mean, I think he's a very competent designer mm -hmm. and he has a good ear for um, what music should sound like. I, I haven't been unimpressed by an Andrew Jones product. Um, I happen to have a little baby sub that's a Andrew Jones pioneer. And, and he's a household name in the industry. And I'm not, you know, let's just face it. So that's why we're here today. We're going to make you a household <laughs> name. It might only be 10 households, but there will be households. But but I did buy his Pioneer speakers and uh, putting them on, on an amp that was not powerful enough, they really didn't sound good. I had a 50-watt amp, and I gave them to my father, whose amp was only 20-something watts, and yeah. I was really disappointed. So mm -hmm. there's that whole issue of do you have enough power to make them sing? Mm -hmm. And I'm looking for a speaker that – will sound good at relatively low volumes. So maybe your stuff works yeah. in that the bedroom late at night, people are asleep. Yeah. I don't need to blast the place. I'm listening to soft music anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Watts kind of. is cheap. That was the same thing that uh, Teal said, T-H-E-I-L, very mm -hmm. famous speaker brand. I, right. Um, I don't know if they're, are they still in business? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm familiar with them. They were very big in the probably yeah. 70s or 80s. Yeah. So uh, high watts that are poorly that are misadvertised as being high watts. Those watts might not actually exist. That might just be vaporware, <laughs> like saying that the amplifier puts out 300 watts, and it does not. And you can well, measure at, that and find at out. 10 percent harmonic distortion. It might. Yeah. Yeah which is completely unlistenable and, and 1% harmonic distortion from a solid state amplifier is completely unlistenable, but uh, you can get two, 3% harmonic distortion out of a tube amp and it's uh, beautiful and you, you might not even notice it. Now my own, you know, preference is for very low distortion. I, for instance, I use a solid state preamp, driving my tube amps you know i'm not a i'm not a campy guy i don't do all the same thing all the same way you know it doesn't have to be all tube amp chain and all you everything you really use amp. solid state preamp i'm kind of surprised to hear that oh yeah yeah well it, it was cheap it's got a lot of inputs uh you know it has a great potentiometer and um you know and I have the opposite on my big system. I have tube preamp 
and solid state yeah. uh, power amp. Right, and what so you're I'm, doing there is you're, you're mixing- I'm blown flavors. away here. <laughs> oh, well, well, you're mixing flavors the same way I am. You know, you're you're throwing the, the, the bacon on top and I'm throwing the bacon on bottom. You know, it's just, <laughs> but, right. It does, and in, and in a way, what I'm trying to say is that your your stereo is correct, and my stereo is correct because they have a blend of aesthetic, you know. So the tube gives an amplifier a certain warmth and an aesthetic to it, and the solid state gives it a, a crispy detail and dynamic scale, and and you need some of that too, you know. You now. Of course, you can have an all solid state system that sounds fantastic. You can have an all, all tube system that sounds fantastic, but it's a little bit easier to get there if you mix. Um, and that's, you know, just a cheaper and easier uh, way Interesting. to do it. Interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Um, let, we, we have gone close to an hour. So before we wrap up, we can, we can go as long as you want, but not everybody out there can handle this for more than an hour. Yeah, you get the opportunity to uh, tell us about your products. Sell sell us some products. What? Uh, and uh, you're not you're not you're not a you're not a salesman like a lot of people. So I may have to draw that out of you. But, <laughs> but um, you're in business to sell speakers, and we want as many people to hear them as possible. So if somebody watches this show and goes to your website. And uh, wants to buy a speaker, we we uh, welcome that. And of course, there's your some dog appears on your website. What did I want to show? That was the photographer's dog, actually. The photographer's dog. So your your website does a little thing where it wraps around mm -hmm. what do they call carousel stuff? Oh, I wanted to show your web your. Uh... So the the tagline handmade audio for people who make there we go for music. There's the uh, website. Yeah. Took me a while to hit the right button. Sorry. So that tagline. Look over your tagline, so you have to give it again. Yeah, it's uh, handmade audio for people who make time for music, and it's the slow food movement. You know, we're th these are not sold on Amazon. They are not sold at your local big box retailer. They are sold through me. I build them slowly. Uh, sometimes there are delays. Um, and you you pay full price, you know. Sorry, there's really not much on sale. Um, it's sustainable craftsmanship. I've been doing this since 2006, uh, and you hear, you do hear and feel. You know, you feel the cabinets feel different, and the sound is a physical feeling, and that does feel different. And I am a hundred percent handmade. Uh, I do. Um, hand operated power tools. I don't have any CNC machines that I use in production, though I do build um, jigs and, and stuff to trace with my routers on a CNC machine at times. Um, but I'd really try to make most of my patterns by hand. Like if you scroll back up a little bit, down, 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 uh, down, <laughs> down, down, <laughs> down, 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 still down. More down. Yeah, more there. Up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the little terminal plate, that oval, was a pattern that I made and with a uh, an ellipse maker, which is a string and two points and then pencil, and you just roll around the perimeter of the string. Oh, pardon me. Uh, yeah, that's a little um, grade school level, um, how to create a... How to create a an oval is a circle with two center points, let's yeah. say. But uh, that's an upgrade, so those don't come on your speakers unless you upgrade them? No, no, those are on the new ones. And then I sell the upgrade for the any prior client. You can install those on your Blumensteins. You could put those on these. These have the old terminals. And the, the terminals that I use are low mass. Um, and they just, they just sound better with the, these apparently cheap binding posts. These actually sound awesome. Uh, these are a little bit beefier ones is what I'm selling on the new terminal plates. Well, before someone goes out and buys terminals and, 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 and holes for the back of their speaker, we have to get them interested in buying the whole speaker. So 
yeah. Back to uh, what I call uh, a little bit of salesmanship. Let's go back to the. Uh, if someone is looking at your speakers for the first time, there's really a couple of places they should start. If you want to tell us about the most popular brands or most popular uh, uh, models. Okay, so my right. first model is the Orca. Let's go to um, Orca. And those are very are, reasonably priced. Yeah, yeah. Um, those are available in a couple different finishes and thicknesses. Uh, that's a little bit older, fo older photo if you were to call in and I can give you the rundown of the new material options and I'm seeing something that looks a little bamboo-y. It's a caramelized bamboo. Um, Caramel. Delicious. Yeah. yeah. Very strong material. Uh, excellent strength to weight ratio. Good reliability. And when, and when I say reliability, I'm talking like this object will be around for 50 or 100 plus years. You know, this isn't 15-year product cycles. This isn't 1.5 year product cycles, which is what most things are on now. Um, these are not going to be obsolete. That driver is available commercially. That's a Fostex driver. It is off the shelf. And that's the best part about it because the Fostex engineering team are total uh, badasses, pardon my French. And I've hung out with these guys. You know, they, they really know their stuff. Um, and they are putting- are in America or Europe, where's, where's Fostex? They're in Japan and Japan. then they're factories in China and as well as Japan and Taiwan. Uh, they're, a, they're a multinational corporation. Uh, however, it, they're not evil. You know, they're actually a, a really interesting uh, group of people. And um, actually, the drivers behind me, these Feastrexes, uh, this company hired uh, the, a Fostex engineer to help them refine this unit back in the early 2000s. So within Japan, uh, so yeah, Feastrex is a Japanese production, handmade artisanal driver. This is my top end range. They start at 15,000, they go up to over 100,000 a pair. Um, and most of that cost is the driver. Uh, and um, and they're worth it. They're, wow. they're excellent. And then- wow. The Feastrex uh, driver is very inexpensive. Huh? The Fostex driver is relatively inexpensive, and you can um, that 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 driver's probably been around for decades. The Fostex driver, right? Yeah, yeah. So the little right. three-inch Fostex, they uh, started making those in the '70s, and um, they were used professionally for uh, video monitoring and, like, you know, TV news vans. They have these little tiny Fostex monitors. And the performance of those mattered, especially in the vocal range. Um, but the those drivers are super popular in the DIY community stateside, as well as Japan and up in Canada. Um, now, one of the interesting things about full range is that every different size has its own sound. So a three-inch full range uh, sounds like a three-inch full range, uh, maybe a little bit less so than other driver sizes, but once you get into larger cone diameters, like a six and an eight inch and a 10 inch and a 15 inch, those don't just make more bass, they make different treble. And that's actually a, a problem with them is that once you get larger, um, you have less of a point source um, and more frequency anomalies. Um, it's, it's just not all a gimme, you don't get it for free. So I tend to, I tend to gravitate more towards the smaller cone diameters. I do make one large, uh, large speaker called the Triton, and that uses an eight-inch uh, GRS, which is a remake of the Pioneer Bofu driver, which is a famous uh, eight-inch in the DIY community. Um, and that uses a little super tweeter up top as well. So the last thing I wanted to say is that Watts, Watts isn't cheap, and that's also bad grammar. Um, <laughs> and, but, uh, you know, what really isn't cheap is magnetism and focused magnetism. So focused is kind of the key word. The voice coil gap, you want it to be as tight as possible. 
and the machining behind that is very you know advanced uh, to get the the driver to fit the voice coil in a tighter and tighter gap. So, for instance, the the Feastrex desi designers um, they use exotic magnetics. This is a uh, electromagnet pair of drivers behind me. They have a charged magnet, and they have their own power supply right mm. there. Um, and that's pretty, uh, uh, that's pretty unusual, I think. Yeah, yeah. An electromagnet inside a speaker. I always thought that would be a good idea, and I didn't know anyone had ever done it. Well, it was I a good idea back in the uh, 1920s as well, and the 1910s. And it used to be that all drivers were electromagnets, and then we figured out how to charge magnets, the permanent magnets. And then permanent magnets got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, uh, and smaller and smaller in speakers uh, because the wattage output got higher. So back in the 1930s, um, we had powerful magnets, but low power amplifiers. And that was the reason that you needed a high efficiency speaker. Now, SET amplifiers all date back to the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And, um, and some of some are in the 60s, but a lot of it went to push pull by then. Anyways, the, the point is, is that if you're trying to use a silky smooth, beautiful sounding low wattage tube amplifier, you need a high efficiency speaker. And by the way, this one watt is not cheap. Those amplifiers retail for $16,000 a pair. And you have one for each channel. Oh no, it, yeah, yeah, it, it's a pair. So 8,000 8, bucks, whatever. The point is, is that if you're trying to get one very, very, very good watt, that is not cheap. And, and the design process is not cheap and the parts are not cheap. Uh, if you're trying to get a hundred sort of mediocre watts, yeah, sure, that's cheap. And by the way, go measure that and it's not a true hundred watt amplifier. Um, so what we're going for here, and, and I guess, you know, I'm not a typical, I'm not a marketer. Uh, I'm, I'm a physics guy. I'm you're, trying you're to not because people. I asked you to sell your speakers and you're telling us about physics. So that's yeah. okay. <laughs> right. but, but, <laughs> no, the, the point is. I gave him a free infomercial and he wants to teach us physics. So that's yeah. okay. Well, and, and, and people should learn the physics because it's, it's what we're, we are bombarded by marketing. We are constantly <laughs> You know, Burger King, McDonald's, ah, it's like buy everything. No, I don't. I don't have the money to buy everything. You want the fast food of speakers? Yeah, definitely. No. <laughs> exactly. So, so I I am doing my very darn best to create and sell the truth. And when you call me, you get as much of the truth as I know. Um, in my little shred of it, in my world of high efficiency high efficiency speakers and solid state or tube amps. Um, you know, they, they really, my, my speakers are cool because you can hook them up to uh, a, an old receiver and they're gonna sound fantastic. And that's because old receivers usually make about three or five good watts. And that's all you need to drive my speakers. Uh, but push them harder than that and they start to fall apart. However, if you're looking to maximize that three to five watts that it takes to fully open up my speakers, then you're going to be spending more and more money on the same amount of wattage. You know, so your tube amplifier goes from a thousand bucks to five thousand bucks to you know eventually what those are, and um, and I've I've built a number of tube amps. Uh, you can have the same power output, the same tube, and different design tube amps, they'll sound totally different. Uh, so Watts isn't cheap and, and get it, get it right. Um, okay. There's a, an anecdote. is what's yeah. going to unlock your, your wattage and the magnetism is expensive. Uh, for instance, these drivers have like a three inch cone and they also have a three inch magnet. So the magnet is, is, the power to weight ratio of the driver is what dictates the efficiency. Um, 
Now, like, could I use an even more efficient driver in these speakers? Sure. The price is going to go through the roof. Um, and the sound might not improve that much. So even my designs, you know, I'm using an off the shelf driver uh, and, and some compromises, calculated compromises here and there um, to try to get people simply just the most for their money. Um, you know, the price points are not extreme. Uh, 600 bucks for a finished pair of speakers. It's been yeah. listened to. Can um, we go back to the, the uh, uh, purchasing the speaker? Because this is a real question. Out of stock waiting list. What's the deal? If someone wanted to buy the Orcas today, yeah. are they going to wait weeks, months, years? Oh, it'll be a couple of months for those. And that's because I'm retooling for the tuned thickness uh, release. And I also have some orders ahead of you. And if and they uh, have some line, I'm sorry. <laughs> new model releases. Yeah. Let's see. It, it quickly yeah. turns into Seinfeld soup kitchen line. You know, like you. It. I. I. I ask that people out a lot. clients come my way. If you are a polite uh, person who can wait patiently, then I want your business. And if you're not. Then go to Amazon or go go buy Andrew Jones stuff. I really don't care for your money, um, and I, I I'm fine without it. Like I I have an option with how I spend my day. I I choose to build speakers, and I want the most appreciative people looking at those speakers. You know, I know that I'm not going to change the world with what I do. I'm not going to blow seven billion people's minds with my single driver products. Um, so, you know, we're, we, we are asking for uh, a, a, a community uh, around the brand that, that you understand that when you're purchasing my products, you're furthering uh, development of new physics technologies that I, that I am legitimately uh, an inventor of. I've invented uh, damping material techniques I've invented the tuned thickness. Go try to find tuned thickness cabinets anywhere else where they make the top thinner than the sides. That's new. It seems very basic, but I know I'm the first person doing that. I know I'm the first person doing the little damping balls. Uh, and there's some other stuff, you know, that electronically speaking that I'm, that I'm doing that's unique. Now, it, am I the, the outright inventor of that? You know, hard to say, but you're, you're buying craft technology. And that's where that, gray area between the inventor and the artisan comes you know at, at what point is a violin maker uh doing something new that wasn't done by stradivarius you know and that's it's hard to say but a top of the top of their game violin maker in today's world might be making really really nice violins and that's kind of the point um and art, art, artisanship, is that a word, is worth paying for and and waiting for. And yeah. people who just want to find the cheapest thing on Amazon will end up with maybe less uh, satisfying sound. But um, And you're still welcome to call me for audio <laughs> advice. Even if you don't want to buy my speakers, I will still recommend the most suitable product to you that that uh, that fits the bill and fits your listening tastes, um, not mine, and that you know is is really a tailored approach for you. And I don't charge for that service. You know, I I, I am I got, an audio. I thought consumer. this call was going to cost me two hundred dollars. <laughs> right, and no, no, we're, we're much less formal than that. Um, um, you know. So, so the speaker line. I'm really I am interested in understanding the speaker line because you have two two speakers that are inexpensive, the Marlin and the Orca, and they're similarly priced. Are they vastly different? Because there's only a hundred bucks difference between them. Two sides of the same coin. So the Marlin is a aluminum dust cap, faceted aluminum dust cap. It's also a Fostex driver, a uh, little bit different paper. It's more of a studio sound and it has mm -hmm. a slightly stronger high frequency response whereas the orca is a more uh softer sound um ever so slightly higher efficiency paradoxically 
um, because the Marlin's magnet is bigger, but the Orca's got a lighter weight cone um, and a looser uh, surround. So the, the Orca is more like for late night home listening. Marlin is more for daytime. However, the overlap in these Venn diagrams is huge. It's just mm -hmm. two sides of the same coin. So maybe if you're a little bit uh, older listener, if you've lost some of your high frequency hearing, the Marlin might be your choice. That's, if, that's think, exactly where I was going for for me. Yeah. Because yeah. I keep being told by my family that I can't hear a lot of <laughs> high end. And you maybe I need more sizzle on the high end. So um, yeah. exactly. I wasn't sure you were going to go there, but. That's, oh. that's a very interesting, uh, appro appropriate comment. Sure. And, and the same uh, level of performance is more appealing as desktop studio monitors as well. So for desktop studio monitors, you need a little bit flatter response. And the Marlin has an ever so slightly flatter response. Um, it's a little bit more true to life, to the music. And the Orca is, is a wider brush stroke. It's a bit more artistic in its presentation um, and figurative rather than literal. So that's, that's yeah, the Marlin is very literal. The Orca is, is kind of figurative. And, um, and those are really two different artistic ends of the spectrum that you might yourself end up on. And that's why I make those two closely different, uh, different models, yeah. Um, but they would both would be appropriate for stand stand mounted because you mentioned uh, near field listening for the Marlins. Yeah, yeah. So you can do stand mount with them. They'll actually handle a surprising amount of power. They'll fill a big room, um, but you need a subwoofer um, at hundred percent. Now, no, no, no. Sorry, not a hundred percent. I have a lot of people using these speakers without subwoofers, and they're totally fine with that. And I'm the last person that's going to say you're doing it wrong if you're simply enjoying yourself. You know, if, if you're having a great time, that's the point. You know, that 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 is the end goal. So um, if the lack of additional cables, if the lack of additional cabinets all appeals to you, then, yeah, these are some little speakers that punch out the bass and they do a great job of it for the bass that they do make is is totally alive. And, and engaging and, and awesome. Um, and the, the best part of that, in, in my perspective as an as a incurable audiophile, you know, uh, is that, oh, they're subwoofer ready. So the second you stick a subwoofer on a speaker that's already doing a great job of bass, um, that is the complete picture. Uh, so I've had people use the Marlins with like an SVS 12 inch woofer uh, which is a, a two thousand dollar subwoofer, um, and they loved that. Um, I've had people use the Marlins, so I make a subwoofer that's a five and a quarter, which is about the smallest subwoofer that you can really pair with these speakers, and it's out of the same wood and finish, and it's the same height. Uh, you know, it looks good on a shelf. Uh, it, there's of course some interior design considerations with what I do. Um, I'm, I'm very into architecture and very into uh, artistic architecture, especially not just minimalist approach. Um, I make minimalist speakers because they just, they're like a, you know, they're like a white shirt, you know, or it, it goes with any color sport coat. Um, I, see, I see the Marlin with ports in the back and the front. Are those both still available or have you moved to one design over the other? Yeah, yeah. So the rear ported Marlins are all that I have in stock at the moment. Um, and those are on clearance. And then Ooh. the front port is the new style production. So I switched over to front port to ease people sticking them in a shelf and not mm -hmm. having boundary reinforcement of the rear port, having to pull them out from the wall to get the right sound. So the front but port. If you're on stands, the uh, rear port should be okay if they're at least a foot or two away from the rear? Oh, I mean, the rear port's great. Uh, as it's, it's great up in a shelf, you know, packed up compactly with books on either side. They can be bookends. You know, you can, 
totally compromise the arrangement of any of my speakers and they're still going to come out uh, sounding great. Um, the front port is to get a little bit more ideal acoustic behavior and a little bit better bass response. Uh, actually, they don't go quite as low into the bass as the rear port, but that's fine uh, because the bass that they do make is a bit punchier and stronger and more in phase and, and et cetera. So, is that the clearance price right there? Or is, that, uh, is there an even better clearance price for those cheapskates out here? Oh, so the photo that you have pulled up is for the front port Marlins. That would be a couple month production time. Mm -hmm. And then the rear port Marlin is the one that is 549 currently. The rear port is 549. The front port is 649. Yep. And you take all major credit cards, I assume. Maybe not. Maybe you only take all pay. and Apple Pay and <laughs> and um. um hmm? I had an important question that I, oh, so speaking of old world design, I'm going to change the topic here just a little bit. Um, old world design, vintage, analog. My channel has really started about talking about vinyl records. Yeah. Are you a vinyl enthusiast versus a digital? Do you have a strong opinion, one or the other? Ah. Uh, in terms of your listening, in terms of what pairs with your speakers? Uh, everything. Uh, <laughs> I... I support all formats, cassette tape, 78, uh, VHS, you know, DVD and, and uh, Blu-ray. And, and uh, I, have, I have YouTube Premium, Spotify, Bandcamp, uh, Tidal, Cubas. Um, and I have, you know, six different record players. The one behind me is a 1965 Mitchell Transcriptor, which is um, a classic uh, and I, I use it most regularly just because I love the the experience of putting a record on the little dots and it's floating in the air. It's, it's so cool. Um, and it, it sounds great. I have a I have some better sounding turntables. I have a Thorin's TD124 with an SME 3009 uh, classic setup. Um, the tone arm he just mentioned. Yeah, yeah. For those of you who don't know. Um, and you are you are you MC versus MM? Because if you're really super high end, oh, MC, oh. and this is a whole yeah, no, whole yeah, yeah, yeah. we could do an hour on. But yeah, I, I have all MM stuff, moving magnet. Uh, but the more high end people, the more expensive turntables have usually have uh, something called moving coil, which I'll is more right sensitive and fancy and expensive, super low output. Uh, moving coil cartridges tend to be the choice of the high-end audiophiles out there. And here comes Isaac Smith. I'm gonna, what's he have to say? If yeah. you want to get feel on speakers or woodwork and infect your cruiser, you should absolutely give Clark a call. I have another one of your fans, I think, here. Oh, yeah, Henrik. Hey, Henrik. <laughs> Great to see you. <laughs> so this here is a 16-inch... Uh, it's missing the counterweight currently, but this gonna, is a mahogany tone arm. I'm blowing you up here. Let me get rid of the comments here. A tone arm made out of mahogany, which is the L103R. Better sonic qualities than plain old aluminum or something, maybe. Yeah, what kind of so what kind of cartridge is on there? This is the Denon DL103R, which is an MC, and then oh, I have a, a very famous, one. inexpensive MC. That's like a, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. That's one of the more reasonably priced MC cartridges. Correct. Yeah. That that can sound awesome. Um, it, it is not a, a, a Hano, Hanawa cartridge or, you know, it's it's nothing those, extremely those are high super end, expensive. But, those are 10000 or something. Yeah. Yeah. But the this is where I bought it from a friend. This is a Pete Riggle Woody uh, tone arm. And um, I actually supplied him with enough wood to make about a thousand of these. Uh, he's in his seventies, though, so you should order them soon if you want one. <laughs> and uh, they're, awesome. they're really extraordinary. Uh, it's a fully manual setup. You know, there's no numbers on the unit itself. You just do it by ear. You do it by measurement. Uh, is the the tone arm setup and then. 
of course it has this famous uh vtaf feature right here and i mean just look at the branding you know it's That's probably a thousand dollar tone arm right yeah yeah uh and and well, if you make a thousand of them he'll be in good shape <laughs> they're That's they're worth their weight Damn. and uh worth their weight in gold um and I stick that as a second tone arm on my Thorin's TD-124. Um, so then I've got you know two tone arms on that deck. I have a U-turn orbit out of Maple uh, really? with Ortifon Blue cartridge. Very reasonable starter system is the uh, U-turn. That's hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so my you know I. When, when guests come into the house, which I haven't had very many guests here being COVID and all, uh, and it's pre-vaccination and stuff. But yeah, so I, I have the U-turn in the in the public area, you know, the, of the home. So if they mess up the cartridge, it's just an order font blue. And then I have the higher end stuff up here upstairs in the, in the room that people kind of get vetted before they're invited in here because you can trip over a $16,000 tube amp. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, we don't want that. So, um, so yeah, then I've got uh, three different Technics quartz turntables that you, the, the kind that come from the thrift store. Uh, so do I. Yeah, yeah. I have three or four of them, and those are for children and other people to, to play their records on, but they don't yeah. get to touch the fancy ones. And literally, I have one system that's probably all thrift shop stuff in the other room. Yeah. It's a perfectly good turntable. Yeah. How many pieces of electronics will continue working after 40 years with zero maintenance? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Except the techniques direct drive turntable. So big yeah, fan of it. Exactly. And uh, in the shop, I've got, you know, one of those because the wood shop, you definitely need a dust cover and, and automatic because I'm, I'll throw a record on and then I'm doing woodwork for longer than 22 minutes and the record runs out. It's nice to have the automatic tone arm return um, and just overall robustness and reliability in the wood shop is a big deal. But I, I do have good hi-fi in the wood shop. I'm a, a huge believer in um, great sound everywhere. It, it fits, it, it is meant to dovetail into our lives. You know, it doesn't just need to be an exotic listening room like I'm in um, to be able to lose yourself in the music. It's, it's about the song that's playing, you know, and that's, that's really like, if I can say anything to about, you know, what vinyl means to me and why I jumped on your channel and thought this was a great idea is that vinyl, there are, uh, years and years of music that are never going to make it to Spotify. Uh, you have to go dig in record crates and be a musicologist. You know, sud suddenly you're, you're giving yourself a degree in musicology, thumbing through records and, and seeing stuff that you don't buy that day. But just the, the visual style that is on the record sleeves. And I mean, there are just, you know, there's record sleeves that are, riotously funny i mean it's like you know what what the heck were they thinking um i wish i had one around but um this one, like this terrible record sleeve oh yeah yeah it's 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 beautifully ugly um you know <laughs> but it's not it's not ugly you know it's, it's crazy it's psychedelic it's crazy it's so. early electronic music <laughs> it's great and uh yeah i love yeah beautiful experience the sleeves everything but to me it fits in with your whole old world craftsmanship craftsmanship vintage uh they haven't improved some things they're still some of the old technology still works beautifully that's right analog it's vinyl tubes upon. you know i i guess what i'm trying to say is that like it, it doesn't need to be better it, like vinyl is its own thing. It's awesome, the, just the way it is. You don't need to, you know, you don't need a two thousand dollar tone arm to to get the most out of a record. Probably a U turn orbit is a great choice. Um, they're also an American company and hand built, and they they're out of Boston and 
right? I they started, started the business the... before them, and they started and got their marketing straight and, and got their sales pitch a little bit more polished than mine because my <laughs> sales pitch is what is up to what like an hour and a half now, you know. <laughs> and, you, and you and and you never ask for the money. That's the thing, and some people love that. Some people ask for the money up front. You never ask for the money. You just yeah. yeah. Well, I have studied in Japan, and I mean, like it in with Japanese artisans. If you go to them and say, "Here's forty thousand bucks, and I want that samurai sword," no, like pro probably not. <laughs> right? you, don't just, you haven't proved that you deserve it yet. Yeah. Yeah, there there is a little bit of that with my brand. Is and I, I prefer people to call. You know, I prefer I, I prefer not to just get uh, anonymous online sales to people that I never meet. You know, the the reason I do this is to meet music appreciators and get music recommended to me. And that, there's a thousand reasons that I do what I do on a more personal level. Than just purely online sales. Like, yes, that is the business frontage. I, I am an online company. Uh, you're not necessarily welcome to visit, um, you know, my <laughs> factory. Um, you're pro most likely not, and and that's okay, you know, because because it's still a pandemic, and um, you know, so like, it, there there are boundaries, but the the way through them is you just call me on the phone. And, and find out if we jive, you know, if, if, if we have chemistry, you'll probably like the sound of my speakers, you know, and if, and if you're looking for something different, I'm going to tell you, because I, as I mentioned, I really don't want sales that aren't, that aren't uh, going to be lifetime clients, you know, so I'm, I'm looking to build a relationship with people and not just have you know, one and done and, and pump them out. And, and I'm just in there making dust and taking out the trash and, and scrubbing the toilets. And, and, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot involved with being a business owner. That's really not that glorious. And, you know, what, what makes it glorious for me is the personal connection that I get from the clients and for the clients that want that personal connection, it's a real win-win. Uh, whereas if if you're just looking for measurement data and <laughs> and uh, and a, a physics explanation that makes sense, because mine probably doesn't make sense. You know, if, if you're looking for it all to add up in the numbers, you know, I'm probably not your place. But if you're looking to get a beautiful feeling from your sound system and, and to, to beautify your music in a way that will mature every day because my speakers break in for years. The finish years. hardens. Yes, the drivers continue to break in because they're paper. And Fostex is very well aware of this, you know, that Fostex makes drivers to break in on the long haul. Um, Feastrex as well. Uh, I only work with companies as my suppliers that make materials that mature. So I'm looking for mature customers that are good clients you know, and they and they realize that they're consuming art from an artist more than uh, products from Amazon. You know, and that's not to say that I don't buy stuff off Amazon. You know, I, I have to buy certain things off of Amazon, and that's fine. But what I build with that is something that is different, and I you know I ask for for patience, and that's that is the tagline of the company is uh, handmade audio for people who make time for music. And music is an umbrella term. Music in, encompasses myself. It encompasses you and in, in the reviews that you do. It, it encompasses the recording artists, the mastering engineers, which are more important than high res, probably, just to settle. No, I, I haven't settled a debate. I probably started one. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's the artist in every step, and it's the human touch that goes into the recording and the human touch of getting that data off of the recording. And, you know, there is a, there is a boatload of science involved in what I do. And, and I'm a extremely skeptical researcher of my own design paradigm. You know, like I, I try to 
to solvent out all of my own pleasure from what I do when I when I switch mode and get into designer brain, um, you know, I, I look at it as coldly as possible. I look at it as the most unredeeming, uh, unsympathetic reviewer might, you know, how do these speakers suck, right? That's, that's the question I ask myself, how do they still suck? Because they're not perfect, you know? Um, well, Clark, and, if, if, if someone wants to buy your speakers, it's really impossible to listen to them until you get them in your living room. So I, I do you don't really have a dealer network. You don't, do you have any dealers? How do you solve that problem, if at all? So I have one dealer in Tacoma that's a, mm -hmm. uh, an old friend, and he'll do a great job. He sells used vinyl and used audio gear as well. Um, and he's got a really large listening space. He has Marlins and Orcas and subs for me. What's his name? I'm going to look him up later. Yeah, it's Alan Smith. Oh, that's, that should be easy to Google. Smith. No, just kidding. <laughs> 132slotcar.us and then uh, it's uh, it's the name of his business. Okay. Um, yeah. So so I have one dealer in Tacoma and um, he'll he'll give you the introduction uh, if if you call me and if you're in the East Tennessee area uh, we can talk about an in-person listening appointment if you're vaccinated. Um, and, you know, I'd like to see the card as well, because this is my, you know, I, there's only one of me. You know, if, if I get taken down, we don't have this. So, um, and then uh, I do a 60-day uh, uh, trial period. Oh, so I didn't you, know that. That's great. Oh, yeah. So if you pay full price, uh, then you get the 60-day um, money-back guarantee and, um I don't try, you know, restocking. It's just you get you get the full refund, um, and I. I mean, know, that's very uncommon. But that's very rare that anybody isn't happy. It is. It is uncommon, you know, and that's part of why I I like to get the the little phone conversation first. Um, I mean, six hundred dollars is a lot of money to most people, um, you know, and it and it should be. A lot of money for a three-inch driver speaker, so it's, it's more than appropriate to have a, a phone conversation with the designer. Especially, you know, I have the time and uh, and and love of chatting on the phone with with audiophiles and music aficionados and musicians. And um, well, we've done we've done in two and a half hours just you and I on <laughs> these calls. One and a half. One and a half. This this was a this was an hour and a half today. When I called you for, to a test drive, <laughs> I into an hour. Yeah. And then I ran into you on Clubhouse the same day, and that was, I don't know, a half hour. Oh, well, look, I get lonely in front of my tools. <laughs> and I mean, you know, the, the table saw doesn't have a conversation with me. You know, I have to listen mm -hmm. to podcasts. And me too. I do all I that. Do my, just a personal stuff. question. I uh, ran into somebody on Clubhouse named David with the same last name. Was that a real, I assume that's a relation? Was that a? Nope. No, unrelated. Um, but he has reviewed my speakers before and loves them. Completely uh, unrelated. That was just a weird coincidence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Blumenstein Great. is a. Uh, it's like a berg. I want to call it in Switzerland. It's the name of a place in Switzerland. Um, and there are Blumensteins in Germany that are unrelated. So. All right. I. I I assumed incorrectly, so just a weird coincidence <laughs> of the uh, yeah. internet. Clark, we, we should wrap it up here. Maybe we'll have to do this again um, some other time. Um, but we've covered so many areas, uh, I can't even begin to uh, try to summarize, so I won't. But uh, other than to tell our viewers out there to let's, let's reiterate the uh, website not hard to remember, Blumenstein Audio, Clark from Blumenstein Audio, making high efficiency speakers in an old school artisanal manner that uh, I've read great things about online. So um, I think we have to wrap it up, unfortunately. 
Oh, this it's is, been a real we, pleasure. We could go today. for another hour, but I totally have to eat <laughs> breakfast for one thing. Ah, yes. And so forth. But uh, this has been great. Clark, I really appreci appreciate your knowledge, your input. But uh, stay on and I'll, I'll say goodbye to you. But we, we have to wrap it up for those people who are getting. Uh, Can I give a fade out track? Yeah. Okay. Make it something that won't give me a copyright hit. I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> Otherwise, I will sing over it to keep the sound scan software at bay. And this is what the speakers sound like, folks. Okay. Goodbye, folks. We're ending, but Clark and I are going to chat. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the Vinyl Rundown channel.